Okay, 17th of September, 2021. I see a notification on Netflix, a new series in my favorite genre. People forced to partake in sadistic games where if you lose, you die, as metaphor for capitalism. So obviously I was like, yeah, bitch, sign me up. But in the weeks that followed, what was surprising is just how many people signed up. Within 28 days, Hwang Dong Hyuk's Squid Game was the most watched show on Netflix ever. What before had been my fairly niche interest was suddenly inescapable mainstream news. But is its success just the viral spawn of spectacle derived from an easily understood social issue riding the wave of Korean culture's current international popularity on a platform algorithmically driven to maximize viewership? Yes. But maybe the final ingredient in that soup of success is a growing awareness for a certain kind of absurdity that isn't as far removed from reality as a genocidal game of red light green light might appear. Of course, Squid Game focuses on making visible the very real everyday deaths of thousands of people crushed under and obscured by vast, uncaring systems of inequality and oppression. A literalization of the gambling people are forced to undertake that exposes the reality of the phrase, if you die in the game, you die in real life. But this genre is positioned to expose this architecture of absurdity at an even more fundamental level. And it's been predicting our downfall for decades. In 1997, Vincenzo Natale's film Cube trapped six characters in a maze of intersecting cubes. Those cubes then splitting together to make one mega cube. It, it was an app title. These characters must solve a puzzle to both find the exit and avoid the booby trap. But the final puzzle, the one that actually takes center stage in this otherwise simple narrative, is like, what? Like, where did the cube come from? Why are we here? What does it want from us? And we receive multiple suggestions, from accusations of government conspiracy to the explanation that features in Squid Game. It's some rich psycho's entertainment. But the answer ultimately delivered by the film's resident nihilist has implications that reach far further than any governing body or mere individual. As I was beginning to research this essay in earnest this summer, I began to see this final theory of the cube play out in my home city, London. Not as a cube, but as a mound, the Marble Arch Mound, arduously erected in July of 2021 to the bafflement of Londoners everywhere. Because looking at the mound, I was met with familiar questions. Like, where did the mound come from? Why is it here? What does it want from us? And I wasn't the only one, because the mound was a disaster. July's edition of Expectation vs. Reality. It cost £6 million, ticket prices were 4 to £8, pounds. it opened and finished becoming a viral failure, closed three days later, reopened for free throughout August, the deputy leader of Westminster Council resigned because somebody had to take the fall for this clusterfuck, it was then announced it would be free indefinitely and they'll scrap the whole thing in January. But what's most baffling is how anyone thought this was a good idea in the first place. Like the cube. Somebody had to say yes to this thing. It was proposed as a way of creating more green space in London, on the corner of its fourth largest park. It was said to provide views over London, but you can't see shit. Not to mention accusations of it detracting from an existing iconic landmark. It was a plan to lure visitors back to the West End, like a fiver on a piece of string. Oi. But if they're not tempted by the West End, in which many of London's major tourist attractions, shops, businesses, government buildings and entertainment venues are concentrated, I don't know why a mossy hill that looks like a game asset glitched halfway through rendering is going to seal the deal. Were they just bamboozled by the magical fantasy land perpetually marketed by project proposals? Where instead of wheelie bins and social distancing, there are crowds of delighted onlookers spending lots of money and remarking, Oh, doesn't the mound look beautiful in the twilight, Henry? The studio claimed it's a folly in the best British tradition. And maybe they're using that word literally. A costly ornamental building with no practical purpose. Or maybe it's the more common modern usage. Lack of good sense. Because it's true, both of these things are very British. The whole operation, compared by Dan Barker on Twitter to a car park Santa's grotto, is overall very British. Like, you'll take your trees and your bit of grass and you'll be bloody happy with it! 
But also, as many replies allude to, it's just another in a line of unfulfilled promises that have come to define the country's government. Unfinished, badly planned, maybe we should just scrap the whole thing in January. And then, like they apparently did with the mound, launch a review to understand what went wrong and ensure it never happens again. But despite the number of times it appears alongside the word pointless, it isn't quite accurate to say the mound had no purpose. As Serena Mohammed writes in The White Pube, it was built with the primary purpose of actively facilitating capitalist modes of exchange. Everything else is secondary. But what that kind of project inevitably lacks is any real meaning. There were several ill-advised shortcuts that led to the mound status as worst attraction ever. That the council never sought specialist construction, instead choosing a firm that specialised in roadworks because they had existing contracts with them. Or when the size of the mound had to be scaled back for fear of damaging the arch, the smaller structure could no longer support soil. So the actual plans of the proposal were replaced with these pre-grown blankets of turf. But even with proper bedding, it would take at least between 5 to 10 years to look like the plans. Despite these early issues, Councillor Paul de Moldenberg reports, the council basically said, this is going to happen. A total fait accompli. And this is how things that shouldn't happen, happen. You have to use it or you admit it's pointless. But it, it is pointless. Quentin, that's my point. This is the final theory of the cube and the final shortcut in the mound coffin. What happens when we eliminate any real point or value from the equation? The mound is a monument to the way capitalism hollows out meaning and replaces it with profit, like a cuckoo laying its egg in another bird's nest. So nothing else even gets a chance, and we're liable to lose sight of why we were ever doing anything in the first place. Cube takes this to its extreme. After realising he was contracted to draw plans for the cube's hollow shell, Worth concludes that maybe, like him, no one realised what they were building. I mean, this is an accident, a, a forgotten perpetual public works project. Nobody is in charge. I mean, it's, it's a headless blunder operating under the illusion of a master plan. Which is exactly what we're seeing now with algorithmic production. The scandals birthed from the breeding of stock photo libraries with on-demand printing, where designs like this were made possible because neither creator nor distributor were aware of the products being advertised. Just a computer program that would randomly pair the phrase keep calm with a verb and a noun. Made at the very end of the 20th century, Cube reflects cultural fears around technology. Technology! Director Vincenzo Natali explains, this is a group of people who have literally been swallowed by technology, by an abstract geometric world. And the world around us is becoming, you know, more convoluted and more um, mathematically based. It's the fear that as we rely more and more on these new technologies, we understand less and less, a state that easily leads to unintended consequences. In 2017, writer and artist James Bridle investigated the influx of weird, disturbing videos aimed at children on YouTube, ranging from bizarre and uncomfortable to explicitly sexual and violent. Bridle reports, What is occurring here is clearly automated. Stock animations, audio tracks, and lists of key words being assembled in their thousands to produce an endless stream of videos. And just like the characters in Cube try to rationalise the existence of the contraption they find themselves in, Bridal received many hypotheses in response. Grooming tools, a product of one company, a rogue AI, international state-backed plan of corruption. Because the alternative, that there's no malicious intent, no purpose, no reason at all, is somehow worse. Because it confronts us with the reality that we have built a world which operates at scale, where human oversight is impossible. And what we're experiencing is simply a kind of violence inherent in the combination of digital systems and capitalist incentives. Nobody knew what it was. Nobody cared. You think anybody wants to ask questions? All they want is a, is a clear conscience and a fat paycheck. No one meant to traumatize children, or promote violence, or trap people in a death maze. But our technologies are programmed so that all that matters is the most efficient route to profit. And like HAL, the supercomputer in 2001 A Space Odyssey, 
Optimizing for efficiency, prioritizing the mission, comes with unexpected casualties. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. But while many sci-fi stories center technology as the source of this absurd logic, we're capable of cutting corners without the need for algorithmic intervention. One example detailed in Bridal's book New Dark Age is Diedrich Staple, the Dean of Tilburg University's School of Social and Behavioral Sciences, who, in 2011, was forced to resign when it was revealed he had fabricated the results of almost every study he put his name to. Staple blamed his actions on the pressure on academics to publish frequently and prominently in order to maintain their positions. It extends to houses. The blog McMansion Hell catalogues the grotesque results of buildings designed in order to cram the most features inside for the lowest costs. Because, as writer R.S. Benedict contributes, they are not built to be homes. They're built to be short-term investments. These features exist to increase the house's resale value. Benedict continues to explain how the same fate has befallen our bodies. It too is a collection of features. Six-pack, thigh gap, cum gutters. And these features exist not to make our lives more comfortable, but to increase the value of our assets. These are all examples of how optimizing for certain signifiers of value, like number of papers published or en suites fitted, can overtake the reason those things mattered in the first place. And technology is just another product of the same profit-driven ideology, exacerbating these shortcuts simply by enacting them more efficiently. It's not causing the problem, it's revealing it. Because its efficiency is what has finally made this systemic erosion of meaning undeniably visible. What happened on YouTube happened because neither the algorithm serving the videos or the children watching them have yet been programmed to go, what? To be made uneasy by the strange events unfolding on screen. But any human viewer out of infancy will immediately recognize this for the uncanny valley shit that it is, right? The unsettling space between human and machine that haunts even a highly produced channel with human actors. Because, as Bridal writes, there's still something weird about a group of people endlessly acting out the implications of a combination of algorithmically generated keywords. But isn't this kind of what a lot of content is? So many YouTube videos are made not for the love or need of it, but just to make content. And we watch them because, hey, it's something to do, I guess. But content doesn't exist to enrich our lives, only to perpetuate itself. To paraphrase Bridal, we have those who, numbed and terrified, consume the content, and those who, low paid or unpaid, exploited or abused, make it. In between sit mostly automated corporations taking the profit from both sides. It's just that only when it's taken to the extreme can we really see it, whether through an algorithmic accident or dystopian fiction. Like the work of video artist Mika Rottenberg, whose film No Nose Knows creates bizarre parallels between factual and fantastical modes of production, focusing on the exploitative extraction of wealth from both natural resources and routinized labor, highlighting the hollow value of supposedly precious produce while questioning the ethics and very meaning of its production. As the artist reflects, it's really pretty perverted what has to be done to a living thing to force it to create a pearl. And this absurdity resonates because, against our present reality, it makes a sad sort of sense. Bridal reminds us, it should be no surprise when infrastructures designed to support their business models fail us as individuals. Ultimately, this is not an issue of technology or of design. It's what happens to society when its most important functions – education, democratic debate, public information, mutual care and support – are wholly offshore to corporate platforms dedicated to profit-seeking. In this way, we are all complicit. For continuing to support a system in which those who care the least are rewarded the most. This is how we ruin the world? Not with a bang but with a sick old man suffering from diarrhea, indigestive problem, cell phone cover case, Samsung S6. Regarding the mound, it's been said that there's an arrogance commonly found within the architecture industry, 
which views landscape as just the spaces between buildings, rather than the larger setting in which buildings exist. And sure, maybe Pro Landscaper magazine might have a vested interest in that statement, but it reflects the wider landscape of ignored landscapes, the increasingly opaque infrastructures that govern our lives, the increasingly complicated technology that reinforces them, the gaps in between step two and profit where our souls should be. The aggregation of complex systems in contemporary networked applications mean that no single person ever sees the whole picture. The same unknowable neural networks that allowed Squid Game to go viral are complicit in the continuation of the flawed, uncaring ideology the series condemns. The duality of a power structure that only cares about maximizing profits, and those within it who, disenfranchised and excluded, are left so desperate all they can care about is getting paid to the extent that it becomes synonymous with losing your life. Which is why, though we are all complicit in supporting this system, the reality it both creates and exploits is that most people aren't left with much of a choice. Nobody wanted the new Dark Age, Bridal's penultimate chapter concludes, but we built it anyway, and now we're going to have to live in it. So but I guess that's that then. We're in the murder maze. Fate accomplished. Maybe scrap the whole thing in January. Well, if there's one thing that's conceptually redeemable about the mound, it's that while it failed at convincing anyone of its rural disguise, it was always meant to reveal itself, to allow you inside, to show its messy workings in a world where this kind of friction, physicality, transparency, anything that might betray vulnerability is buried, concealed to the extent that our central terminology for the infrastructure that facilitates and administrates so much of our technological existence is the cloud. Only in moments of fallibility are we able to see inside, like a glitch in the matrix. In this way, technology is helping us, like it always tries to do, simplifying our workload, answering our questions, and now allowing us glimpses into the exploitation being encoded into its engineering. A shadow of what being hardwired into the foundations of everything. The deepest architecture of society making it harder to see and therefore harder to understand, harder to explain and harder to defend against. Especially when the primary principle underpinning these systems is the preservation and perpetuation of themselves, no matter how absurd or damaging the outcome. And what was actually inside the mound? Another hollow profit-driven enterprise and an endless series of cubes a reflection and a realisation of Natali's nightmare. Because if we ask a product of this system to really examine it, to deconstruct it, to possibly investigate into its dismissal, well, I'm afraid I can't do that. Dave. <laughs>